My name is Keith Cambron, and this video describes single frequency interference test performed on FT8. In the test, we're going to use our four samples, but we're going to inject different ear interferers uh, for each of the samples. So we'll be doing four tests in one uh, pass. Uh, sample one will have no interference at all, and that'll be our benchmark. Sample two will have a single interferer, and that interferer will be at 1000 hertz. Recall that our uh, signal is at 1500 hertz, so it'll be 500 hertz below our signal, and we'll see what effect that has uh, on the decoding of our signal. Sample three will have a tone of 1525 hertz, that is, it'll be right in the middle of our signal. And these two tones are steady tones, meaning there will be continuous during the period of decode. Sample four will be similar to sampler three, except the tone will be intermittent. It'll have 333 milliseconds on and 333 milliseconds off. And the purpose of the fourth sample is to have some representation of what it might sound like to have a CW operator within the signal band. The levels of the interferer tones will be the same uh, in every pass, but they'll be varied between passes. The levels will start at minus 36 dB and progress all the way to 21 dB during the course of the test in 6 dB increments. So here we have our standard test set up. At the bottom we have the application WSJTX, which is our transceiver. And then at the top we have Audacity, which has our stored samples. We have the same four stored samples. All four are identical and they are an FT8 uh, tone set at 1500 hertz and they give my CQ call. We're going to set that level at 0 dB and then we're going to inject noise and I've prepared uh, three different uh, noises for these samples. For sample number two we have a steady tone at 1000 hertz so that will be an out-of-band tone. For sample two noise, we're going to have the same level tone, but it'll be at 1525 hertz, which means it'll be in the middle of our received band. Tone three will be identical to tone two, except it's intermittent, 1525 hertz and 333 milliseconds on, 333 milliseconds off. So let's set the level for the noise. Okay, it's at minus 36 dB. And now I'll start the loop play. I have to time it precisely so it starts at the same time as the WSJT clock. So here we go. Now let's look at the WSJTX uh, readout and see if we're able to decode. So here's our first tone and this is the tone without any uh, interference and so we would expect to get a clean signal from this tone. And it codes at 7 dB which is about our standard. We want between 5 and 7 dB uh, as our normalized standards to compare everything else to. And we're just about to decode the second sample, which has an out-of-band tone at 1,000 hertz. And we can see from the speaker that the level is uh, perfectly within range. It's in the middle of the range, so we don't expect any overloading. And it yields the same results as the first tone, meaning the out-of-band tone had no effect on our decoding of the signal. The third sample, of course, has the tone in the middle of the band at 1525 hertz.
and it decodes to 6 dB, so still there's very little effect. And of course, the reason for that is that the tone noise or interferes are at a very low level. Also keep in mind, single tone interferes have less energy than broadband or even band limited noise. So the total energy in these tones is uh, less than the previous experiments we've done with interference. And our third tone, or third, or fourth sample rather, uh, yields 7 dB. So now we're going to change the gain of the noise and we'll take it up to minus 30 dB. So we've increased the noise by 6 dB and we'll first see our uh, control sample which has no interference and see if we get a similar result from before. And we do, we get 7 dB again, so we're getting a consistent result there. And now we're ready to decode uh, our sample tone with an out-of-band interference and see if raising the noise level had any effect on that. And we see it didn't have any practical effect. It's it's 6 dB. And now we have our third sample. And this sample has that in-band tone. So we might expect to start to see some effect. And so we failed to decode at minus 30 dB. The in-band continuous tone had a severe effect on our ability to decode. And here's our fourth sample. The third sample did not decode. We had no decode, so we've already lost the third sample because of the in-band tone that's continuous. Our fourth sample has an intermittent tone. It still decodes. So the steady tone um, cause us to lose the decode in the third sample, but we're still decoding our intermittent uh, sample, the fourth sample. Back to the first sample. Again, there's no interfering tone here. I'm going to clear these two windows so we can uh, continue to see the results easily. We still have our 6 dB, so we still have the control case at 6 dB, which is what we would expect. And now we're going to see if we can decode the second sample. And we find it decodes to 6 dB. I'm going to edit this, so we're going to skip the third sample and go directly to the fourth, because the third sample never decodes once we get past this level, and it'll always be a non-decode. There's no point in showing it. And here's the fourth sample. Again, the speaker's not being overdriven. And we'll see if we can decode that. And we cannot. So we've lost decode in the fourth sample. And so in the subsequent video, I'm going to uh, skip those. That was at minus 24 dB. We lost the ability to decode any signal uh, that's in band. So in band interferes have a tremendous effect on the decoder. Again, our normative sample, 6 dB, so we're retaining that. And here's our out-of-band interfere. And you see the level of the speaker getting higher because the out-of-band noise uh, still contributes in the time domain. So we're seeing some noise uh, incur and we see a 5 dB signal noise ratio instead of the 6 and 7s we were getting previously. Again, I'll edit out these last two samples and we'll jump ahead to the next pass. 
In this pass, I'll change our noise level up to minus 12 from minus 18 dB. Again, our control case is still 6 dB. And the speaker continues to get higher levels, as you can see in the upper part of the video. And our out-of-band signal still decoding well. We're at 4 dB, so we're only a couple of dB down. Okay, now we're going to go all the way up to plus 6 dB noise. And, of course, we're skipping the last two tones. We're just going to look at the first two. And we look at the first tone just to make sure our control case is still the same and we have uh, no unaccounted for noise um, in our test. And the decode's at 6 dB, so we're still where we expect to be. And uh, we're going to see our second sample with the out-of-band 1000 Hertz tone and notice the overdriving of the speakers now there's a substantial level coming out of the speakers and it's getting into a non-linear area and the decodes minus 6 dB so we lost almost 1 dB of uh, signal to noise margin for every dB the noise increased and if we look at the waterfall, we can start to see uh, some real dynamics there. The signal is very wide for some of these samples because the speaker is being overdriven and uh, the, the level is extremely high. Plus, in some cases, we can see the out-of-band tone uh, effects of that as well. Up here, we're seeing some harmonics, actually, and some intermodulation distortion. And you'll talk more about that uh, in the analysis. So now we're going to go from plus 6 to plus 12 dB. So that's a substantial tone, even though it's out of band. We're going to see some effects. Because we're going to drive the, the uh, test into nonlinearity. And I'm just waiting to get into a silent period here. There, I set it at 12. And we go back and look in our standard 6 dB still maintain for our control case. And uh, so now we're going to see 12 dB of 1,000 hertz and see its effect on our standard test signal. See how far the speaker is in uh, overload now. So it's a substantial overload. And oddly, we see two decodes, not one. One of the decodes is at minus 18 dB signal to noise. The other is at minus 10. But the frequencies are different. They occur in the same time period, but at different frequencies. What does that mean? So now we're really going to crank up the noise. We're going to go up to plus 18 dB. And uh, really what we're interested in is the effect on the second sample. Uh, but we're going to verify that our test setup is still valid by looking at our control sample and seeing if it's between 5 and 7 dB signal-to-noise ratio. And it is. It's 5 dB, so we're still within our bounds and now we're going to look at the results of a plus 18 dB out of band signal 500 Hertz below our received band and we're really have overloaded the speaker at this point and you can see in the waterfall display uh, some anomalies and look over at 3000 Hertz and 3500 
Now we have two received signals, one at 1500 hertz at minus 23 dB and another one at 3500 hertz at minus 17. So a signal where we weren't expecting it is actually higher than uh, the 1500 test signal. So how is that happening? And we'll again look in the analysis at that. So our final test here, we're going to run this to minus, or excuse me, plus 21 dB. So we essentially doubled the amount of noise. And I'll skip ahead because our normative case is the same, and we'll go right to the second sample and see what the effects are. As we begin to see the second sample, the speakers again are in overload. So we expect some distortions and we're going to see how we decode a plus 21 dB interferer. We do decode, it decodes at minus 21 dB signal noise ratio, but notice the frequency. We no longer have a decode at, my, at 1500 Hertz. We only have one at 3500 Hertz and it's at minus 21 dB. So this is uh, something we'll look at in some depth in the analysis. Here's a brief analysis of the single frequency interference test for FT8. In the tests, we had our four samples, which I've described in each step of the test, and we ran <clears throat> noise starting at minus 36 dB all the way to 21 dB, a range of 57 dB, which is significant. We quickly found that the two tests where the single frequency interferer was in the band, that is test three and test four, that we could no longer decode at relatively low levels of noise, as low as minus 30 dB, uh, we ceased to be able to decode those signals. When the tone was outside our receive band, in this case we were experiencing a tone at 1000 Hertz and our band was at 1500 Hertz, we were able to decode the signals at relatively high noise levels. We got as high as 18 dB and we were still able to decode with a minus 23 dB signal to noise ratio. Keep in mind that this is the measured signal to noise ratio, so the actual ratio was probably somewhat higher. But we observed a new phenomenon. We observed the signal appearing at multiple places in the spectrum. So we detected a signal not only at 1525 Hertz, but also at 3500 Hertz. And in fact, the signal at 3500 Hertz was 8 dB higher when we had a 12 dB noise level. And it was 6 dB higher when we had an 18 dB noise level. When we had 21 dB noise, which is quite high, we could no longer decode the 1500 Hertz signal, but we could decode the 3500 Hertz signal. So what is going on here? How did this alias appear and what does it mean? Well, at these noise levels, we began driving our speaker above saturation so that it was clipping and creating intermod products. And the reason we did that was because we had to create uh, such a difference between the noise and the signal that either the speaker had to be overdriven or the microphone had to go below zero, which it couldn't. So in any situation when we're operating, if the speaker level of the transmitter or the microphone level at the receiver is too high, we're going to overload the audio uh, amplifier and will produce intermod products either at the transmitter 
or at the receiver. In this case, we produced them at the speaker, which was our transmitter. The Intermod products can take multiple forms. Uh, typically, the second harmonic of the signal frequency may be seen, or plus or minus the interferer frequency. And in this case, 3500 is the signal frequency plus twice the interference frequency. So that is the Intermod product we are seeing here. And the data are the same in that alias signal or that Intermod product as they are in the original 1500 hertz signal. So it decoded exactly the same. WSJTX is a passband decoder. It decodes not only the signal mark or the receive frequency, it decodes all signals in the passband. And that's why the aliases showed up in our tests.